Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to go over some of the um, practical aspects of interpreting NMR spectra. It's not designed to give you the theory of how uh, the magnet works and how the radio waves knock the electrons out of alignment and as they fall back into alignment they release energy which can be interpreted as a signal and all this kind of stuff. This is not the point of this. The point of this is to just go through some of the fundamental things um, that you need to know in order to uh, basically interpret NMR spectra. This is what we're going to do in lab um, during the NMR lab. Uh, so doing this before lab will help you. In order to incentivize you to do this, we'll give you five bonus points if you make an honest effort to complete this. Now I'm going to do the first two for you in this video. One of them is done on the paper and the other one I'm going to do out by hand. Um, and so, you know, you, you only really have to do three of them. If it's inconvenient to print this, you can simply just write your answers on a piece of paper. You'll see in a little while that there's no real reason you need to print this. You can find this worksheet in the description below of this video and you can just download it. It's a PDF. You can download it. Now, to be clear, to get the five bonus points, you need to make an honest effort. That doesn't mean that every little thing needs to be perfect, although I do suggest you spend some time on it. You need to make an honest effort. NMR, like anything, takes practice. And if you spend, you know, an hour or so practicing this stuff before you come to lab, the lab will be easier. The um, individual part of the lab will be easier and you'll get more out of your time during the lab by having spent some time on this. So I strongly recommend, although it's not required, that you do spend some time with this and we'll give you five bonus points if you do. All right, so that's enough of that. So now what we need to do is we need to essentially answer these five lettered questions for each of the molecules given here. And there are five different molecules he given here. The first one is 1-chlorobutane. Um, and in this case, I include notes uh, that are pre-written, as you can see if you download this. So basically, we want to identify the equivalent pro protons, the integral for each uh, of set of equivalent protons, the relative uh, chemical shift, uh, relative uh, you know, more upfield or more downfield, the multiplicity or the splitting, and then eventually we want to label the proton spectra. I would recommend, although I can't require, that you label the spectra last because doing all of these things first will help you to understand better what's going on. And as I mentioned before, uh, this uh, basically takes practice. So NMR essentially allows us to look at an atom at the molecular level and look at how the um, the carbons and hydrogens, uh, we're looking at proton NMR, so we're specifically looking at the hydrogens, how they're arranged in the molecule. But knowing something about how the, uh, the hydrogens are arranged, of course, tells us things about how the carbons are arranged as well. And this is something that takes practice. You're going to get NMR in this class almost every week. But the goal is by the end of the semester, you should be able to get some random NMR and a uh, molecule and be able to interpret which peak is which and why is that peak there and this kind of stuff and hopefully this is a skill you develop develop throughout the course of the semester this video and this worksheet is just designed to get you started so you're not going to do this and then be an expert at it but it's designed to get you started and then the lab experiment is designed to help further that um, goal and then as we move throughout the semester you get more chances to practice and hone your skills Interpreting NMR is extremely useful. NMR is actually how um, MRI, the medical imaging technique, works um, as well. So it does have some practical applications. Again, I don't want to get too much into the theory uh, because you know it's going to be. Uh, this isn't meant to be a two-hour lecture. This is simply meant to be. How do I do this? All right. So the first thing we need to do is identify the equivalent protons. So if we look at step A, the first thing we need to do is understand what equivalent protons are. So equivalent protons are protons in the same chemical environment. So they're not um, unique and they're not different than other protons. And a lot of times symmetry helps us to identify um, equivalent protons. So let's look at this example of butane. And this one's kind of messed up and hard to see. But butane is four carbon chain and it has um, 2n plus 2, uh, which is uh, 10 uh, protons. So 3, 5, 7, 10 protons. So this is just butane, the stuff you'd find in a, you know, in a lighter. So 
butane here is going to have a plane of symmetry. In fact, you can see that plane of symmetry as this one is drawn is right here. So this CH2 and this CH2 are essentially the same. This CH3 and this CH3 are essentially the same. So these are equivalent protons. A protons are equivalent and B protons are equivalent. Looking at it a different way, this carbon is next to a CH2 and a CH3. So is this carbon. It's next to a CH2 and a CH3 only. If there was extended chains, we'd have to consider that. But in this case, it's only next to us. This carbon is next to only a CH2 and a CH3, and this carbon is only next to a CH2 and a CH3. This methyl group is only next to a CH2. This methyl group is only next to a CH2. And continuing on, there's more symmetry. So said another way, there's a plane of symmetry. So this is going to have two signals, one for the methyl group and one for the CH2. Let's look at benzene. Benzene has six hydrogens on it. However, all six of these carbon, uh, hydrogens are chemically equivalent. We could draw a mirror plane like this, or like this, or like this. The other thing to realize is that although the benzene has single and double bonds, really because of resonance, these are not single, double, single, double, single, double. They're really all like one and a half bonds, if you will, or there's um, an extended pi cloud, which you'll talk about when you talk about aromatic structures. But the basic idea here is you can't really think about these as single and double bonds. Um, even if you do it that way, there is some symmetry. However, uh, because these bonds are really equivalent, the symmetry is more clear, and therefore this would only show one signal. These are all equivalent protons. So that's how we're going to identify equivalent protons. Next, let's look at the actual molecule that we have, which is chlorobutane. So that was a little bit of discussion on what equivalent protons are. Let's look at chlorobutane, and the answer is here, um, so that when you download this, you don't have to write this all out. In this case, these protons are pretty close to this chlorine, so they're different. These protons are one removed from the chlorine. These are two removed from the chlorine. These are three removed from the chlorine, three carbons removed. So in this case, all of these protons are different. If you remember in regular butane, we had a plane of symmetry here. Um, and the molecule could be, you know, like mirror images on both sides. This is not true when we put a chlorine here, because when we put a chlorine here, this side doesn't have a chlorine and this one does. If this side also had a chlorine, if this was um, one for dichlorobutane, it would only show two unique signals. But because it's only got the one chlorine, that makes the symmetry not there. And therefore, we're going to end up with four proton signals because all of these are chemically unique. They're unique environments. All right, step B or step two. We want to identify the integral of each set of equivalent protons. The integral is literally the area under the curve from calculus, um, but it's the relative number of protons responsible for the peak. So what we want to look at is we want to look at the relative number of protons responsible for a peak. So if we look at the example again of butane, which is CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3, and we'll do chlorobutane in a minute, you'll remember there were two protons, the A protons on the outside, the methyl groups, and the B protons, the CH2 groups, because of this plane of symmetry. If you look here, A is 6, and B is 4. When we integrate, we can only get the lowest common denominator um, because it's a relative number, sort of like empirical formula, if you remember back to that. So when we look at the relative integrations, it's actually going to be 3 to 2 because these have a common denominator of 2. So the area under the curve for this would be 3 times and this would be two times whatever the base value is. So that is what you would see as the integral for these different peaks. Now if we look at um, chlorobutane, sometimes it's an absolute number. So let's just look at the number of protons responsible for each peak. So A is 3, right, because it's got 3 protons. 
B is 2, so it's got two protons. C is 2, because it's got two protons. And D is 2, because it's got two protons. There is no common denominator between 3, 2, 2, and 2. So therefore, these um, integrals are absolute, because there's no common denominator. We don't have to divide by 2 like we did in butane, because there was a common denominator. Note that, very briefly, the reason for this is, if you have two protons, you're going to get twice as much signal. If you have three protons, you're going to get three times as much signal. If you have six protons, the signal is going to be six times as much, because you have six, six times as many protons um, creating a signal. So that's essentially what is going on here. But remember that it is a relative number. The other thing I want to remind you of, or tell you, is that integrals in this course are generally given as a number, a whole number, above the peak. So if you look at this spectrum here, this 2, 2, 2, 3, these are the integrals. This is actually the chlorobutane, um, the one chlorobutane. This, these are the integrals, and we often give them in this way. If you actually take the spectra yourself, you often have to you know, integrate the peaks, although the computer system does it fairly well these days. Um, but you can basically uh, get these relative areas automatically integrated for you. We just get them to whole numbers uh, to make your life a little bit easier. To be honest with you, we download the spectrum and then we write them on there uh, so that they're what they should be. All right, so we've now talked about the integral. So remember, first thing we did, we identified the chemically equivalent protons. We were essentially looking for to see if there were equivalent protons on different carbons. And then step two, we, we identified the integral by just identifying the number of protons responsible for that peak and seeing if there was a common denominator. In the case of the chlorobutane, there was no common denominator, 3, 2, 2, 2, no common denominator. In the case of regular butane, 6 to 4, there was a common denominator, so the integrals would actually be 3 to 2. The next thing is the relative chemical shift. So the closer the protons are to an electronegative atom, like for example chlorine in this case, or oxygen in other cases, the greater the chemical shift, or the more downfield that you're going to see those protons. So first thing I want to do is identify upfield and downfield. So upfield is close to zero, and downfield is close to 10 or 12, depending on the, how far out the, the um, NMR spectrum goes. So downfield is over here on the left, and upfield is over here on the right. So we need to remember that. So as protons are closer to an electronegative atom, they're shifted more downfield. This is because electronegative atoms pull electron density away from that atom. When electron density is pulled away from those protons, essentially they feel the magnetic field more strongly. And when they feel the more magnetic field more strongly, they give a um, peak that is more downfield. That's the theory in 10 seconds, okay? Um, hopefully you've had the theory in the lecture course, um, or if not, you can. there's plenty of videos on uh, NMR where you can learn about the theory. I'm not going to go into it in great detail here. So that's the 30-second version of the theory. So let's look at this particular molecule and decide how far upfield and downfield these different protons are. So what we're essentially looking for because it's relative chemical shift inside of a molecule is, we are looking for the electronegative atom. In this case, the most electronegative atom is chlorine. So the closer something is to chlorine, the more downfield that it's going to be. So if we look at the chemical shifts, D, because it's closest to chlorine, is going to be the greatest. So D is greater than C, because it's one atom removed from carbon, or from chlorine, one carbon atom removed from chlorine. B, two carbon atoms removed from chlorine. And then finally, A, because it's the farthest from chlorine. Once you get three atoms away, these, these don't really feel the electronegativity. They barely feel it um, two atoms away or even one atom away, um, compared to how much they feel it if they're on the same atom. That being said, um, they do they do feel the they do feel the pull somewhat. Furthermore, what we're looking at here is relative chemical shifts. Now, if you have a more electronegative atom, um, the chemical shifts can be greater. So, if this was a fluorine, okay, that would actually pull them further. It can also somewhat affect more the um, atoms further away. 
but this is always relative. So what you're looking for when you're looking for relative chemical shifts is electronegative atoms, in this case chlorine, and how far they are away from the chlorine. So D is the closest, so it's going to have the greatest chemical shift. A is the furthest away, so it's going to have the smallest chemical shift. And that's basically what we're going to see. And I have it written right here. All right. Finally, the last thing we want to do is multiplicity. So we want to identify the multiple multiplicity of a covalent proton. So I don't know what that is there for. Oh, just a typo. So we're going to use the N plus 1 rule. So the proton signal will be split based on the number of protons on the adjacent carbons. So if the adjacent carbon has one proton, you'll get one plus one or a doublet. This is because the spins can be paired so, or they can be opposites. So therefore, you, they can feel the spin of their neighbor. So we end up with a doublet here. If there are two protons on the adjacent on the adjacent carbon, the splitting will be n plus 1, or 2 plus 1, which is 3, which is a triplet. If there are three protons on the adjacent carbon, it will be n plus 1, or 4, which we call a quartet. If there's four or more protons on adjacent carbons, we call that a multiple. So let's look at one chlorobutane and identify what we're going to expect. So let's start with A. So what we want to do is we want to look at the adjacent carbon. In this case, there's only one adjacent carbon. And we see that it has two protons. So we're looking at the splitting of protons A, the protons on A. So we want to look at the adjacent carbon. There's only one in this case. It has two. So we're going to end up with 2 plus 1, because it's n plus 1 splitting, which is 3. And we call that a triplet. For carbon B, with hydrogens attached, we're actually looking at the protons. I keep saying the carbon sometimes, but what we're actually looking at in NMR, proton NMR, is the protons. So let's look. B has two adjacent carbons. There are three hydrogens on this carbon and two hydrogens on this carbon for a total of three plus two, which is five. Five plus one equals six. We generally just call this a multiplet. I guess you could call it a sextet or something, but we just call it a multiplet. Let's look at carbon C. Look at the adjacent carbons. One, two. There's two protons on B and two protons on D for a total of four. So we get four plus one because it's N plus one, which is five. And again, we just call this a multiplet. Finally, D. For D, there's only one adjacent carbon. So in the one adjacent carbon, we can look at how many protons it has. It has two. N plus one, two plus one is three, and we call this a triplet. So in all cases, we're looking at the adjacent carbon or carbons, and we're looking at how many hydrogen are on those carbon or carbons. And then we just add one to the total number of hydrogens, and that is the multiplicity. Again, not much theory here, um, but this does come from the fact that they feel the spin of their adjacent carbons, and they can be spared, uh, paired or opposites. And again, I'm not going to get into much into the theory. So the last thing that we want to do after we've done all of this is we want to try to identify the actual spectrum. Now, there might be a temptation to first identify the spectra from the molecule. I strongly recommend you do steps A through D first for practice, because the more you practice this and you get this down, the easier it is going to be to interpret the spectrum. So let's look at an example. So it asks us to label this uh, spectrum. So I've already called this A, B, C, D. I've identified the um, unique uh, protons, and we see one, two, three, four signals. And remember, these numbers above each peak are the integration. I'm trying to fit this all on the screen here. So this is basically what we have. So what I would like to do before we actually do that is review. What do we know about A, B, C, and D? And then we'll use that information to uh, identify the spectrum. So we already determined the following information. A, let me redraw this so we can see. 
CH3, CH2, CH2, C, H2, Cl. And this is A, this is B, this is C, and this is D. So basically, to review, we know A is a triplet because it's adjacent to two protons. So it's n plus 1, which so that's a triplet. We know it's the most up field, so this is up. Oh, you can't see this, but this is up field, and this is down field. Just to remember, up is to the right, down is to the left. And if you notice, this is numbered backwards, 0 to 10. So up field is close to 0, and down field is close to 10 in this case. Sometimes these go beyond 10. All right, so we know it's the most up field. Remember, the reason we know it's the most up field is because it's the farthest away from chlorine. We also know the integration is 3 because it has 3 protons, and there's no common, lowest common denominator between the number of protons in this particular molecule. Let's look at B. B is a multiplet. How do we know it's a multiplet? Because there's three protons on A and three protons on C. Uh, so, so we have three plus two, which is five total protons. Five plus one is six. We just call that a multiplet. We know that it's between A and C in terms of its um, downfieldedness, if you will, um, because it's relatively far away from the Cl, but it is closer than A. And it has an integration of two because there are two protons responsible for that signal. C. C, if you recall, is a multiplet because if we look at B and D, there's 2 plus 2, which is a total of 4. 4 plus 1 is 5. Instead of calling it you know, a pentet, um, we just call it a multiplet. It's between B and D because it's relatively close to chlorine, but it's not as close as the protons in D in terms of how far downfield it is. And it has an integration of 2, which is the absolute number of protons responsible for the signal. Then finally, D. D is a triplet. Remember, we look at the adjacent carbon. It's got two hydrogens. Two plus one is three. So D is a triplet. It's the most downfield because it's closest to the chlorine and has an integration of two, again, because there's no lowest common denominator. So if we look, and uh, so I just briefly rearrange the camera. If we look, D we know is the most upfield. It is a triplet. And its integration, which was given on the previous, um, which was given on the previous page, was two. This one was also two. This one was also two, and this was three. So this is a signal for D triplet, most downfield because it's closest to chlorine, and it's um, got an integration of two. Let's look at C. These are proton C, multiplet. You can't really tell how many peaks that is, but it looks like a mess. So this is a multiplet because there are lots of adjacent protons. It's between B and D because it's relatively close to chlorine, but it's, um, but it's not as close as the D protons. So you see that here. And it has an integration of two because there's two protons. So this is C. For protons B, if we look at B here, these are B, slightly more upfield because they're slightly farther from the chlorine. Again, it's a mess. It's a multiplet. Can't really tell how many peaks that is, um, but it is a multiplet because it's got protons on both sides for uh, n plus 1, which is uh, 5 plus 1, which is 6, and it has an integration of 2. Finally, if we look at A, A is a, is a triplet. It's kind of hard to see, but you can kind of tell that it's not a singlet. Um, so that's one, that's one, and that's one. This is pretty common. This is a real spectra that I downloaded from uh, the, the, a database. And basically, it has an integration of three, and it's the most upfield because it's the farthest away from chlorine. So doing all this work allowed us to, uh, to identify this uh, spectrum. Again, I strongly recommend you do this part first because practicing doing this part first will help you do this part. It may not be the easiest way to do it, but it will help you when you have to do this individually by yourself um, and you're familiar with what's what. It'll help you to identify these peaks. All right, so now let's now that we've looked at kind of the example one with you know kind of Cliff's notes on what's going on, right? So I filled in a bunch of information here. Um, let's look at the uh, actual questions like you're going to see them on the uh, next ones. So the other four questions look exactly like this. You're given a spectra with, an int with integrations. 
you're given a molecular structure, you're asked to do A through D, and then you're actually asked to label the spectrum. I strongly recommend you do A through D first, even though, as I said several times, it might be easier to do E first this way. You're not always going to be able to do it that way. You're not always going to have the spectrum in front of you. And learning the other way, learning about the integrations and things like that is very, very important. So what I'm going to do is I'll zoom out the camera here so we can see the whole piece of paper, and then we're going to get after this. All right, so now I've got this uh, zoomed out. Let's look at ethyl benzoate. And I'm going to do this um, exactly in the order that is uh, described. So the first thing I'm going to do, A, is actually use the molecule as written to identify the um, equivalent protons. So if we look here, we have this ethyl group, and these protons and these protons are different. So we have this, I'm going to call that A. We have this, I'm going to call that B. These are not the same, right? One is one removed from this double bond O, the carbonyl. This is two removed. These are definitely not the same. So those are unique protons. Now we get to the ring. And ring protons are challenging because what we essentially see in practice um, from a theoretical perspective is that these two protons are the same, these two protons are the same, and this proton is, is unique. So we should have one, two, three different signals. However, in practice, if you look here, um, we only have two peaks, a two and a three. And the reason for that is, although these three protons are not theoretically the same, practically, there's very little difference in the chemical shift between this proton and this proton. So these protons are very similar. These two protons, however, when you have an electronegative group like uh, the carbonyl group here, are going to be somewhat different because they are closer to that uh, group. It's important to notice that these ring protons are really far downfield, and ring protons tend to come between seven and eight, uh, six and eight. And that's something that you just want to remember. So ring protons usually come between six and eight. The reason that's so important is if you're trying to identify a molecule that has a ring, it's gonna have four, maybe five protons on it from that ring. So knowing the ring protons allows you to identify a bunch of the protons. So in this case, I'm gonna call this C and this D. Now, I agree that theoretically this proton should be different. And if you really got it down into it and blew this up, you could probably tell the difference between these two and this one. That being said, we're not going to bother with that. I want to give you another example. If you have a molecule like toluene, methylbenzene, so in this case, toluene, this is not very electronegative. In fact, it's electron donating. If you look at this, you may only see one chemical shift for all five of these protons. And the reason for that is this isn't elect um, electronegative enough to see a difference between them. Is there a difference? Yes. These two are the same, these two are the same, and this one is different because they're different distances from the methyl group. But that doesn't mean the instrument can resolve them. So sometimes the instrument can't actually resolve them. I wish that wasn't the case. I wish there was no subtlety here and everything was straightforward like the rules, but unfortunately, that's not the way it works. So we have to go with what nature gives us, right? We can't just, uh, we can make up rules um, that fit in nature as best as possible, but then you can call them exceptions or you can just say, you know, it doesn't always work exactly as uh, prescribed. So just be aware uh, that sometimes you won't see the splitting, just like here. Instead of seeing these two and this one separately, we kind of see them all together because they're all in the same region and they're kind of messy. Okay, so that is basically that. So in A, we've identified the um, unique protons. We have A, we have B, we have C, and we have D. So, great. Now let's look at B, the integrals. So the first thing I do is I want to write down the absolute number of protons responsible for each signal and then see if there's a common denominator. If there's a common denominator, then I'll have to divide. If there isn't, I won't. So let's look. A is three, right? There's three protons on A. B is two. There's two protons there. C is two, one, two. 
and D is 3. There is no common denominator between 3, 2, 2, and 3, or between 2 and 3. So these are the actual integrals. And if you look up here, we have 2, 3, 2, 3, so 2, 2s and 2, 3s. All right, so the integral here is the absolute number because there is no common denominator. Number, letter C, the relative chemical shift. Now, we said before that it was the importance of the distance to the electronegative atom. But we also have to remember that aromatic protons, um, because of something called ring current, are going to be shifted to between about 6 and 8. You can see here these are slightly above 8 because they're both on a ring and close to an electronegative atom. However, generally speaking, between 6 and 8. Learning NMR by trying to memorize chemical shifts is not the best idea. The, the reason for that is there's a lot of overlap between different things. So really you want to think about relative chemical shifts. But you do want to remember that ring protons are shifted substantially downfield. Six, between 6 and 8 is pretty substantially downfield. Remember that this is downfield to the left and this is upfield to the right. It's something you just got to memorize. All right, so let's look at the relative chemical shifts. So I already said this, but the ring protons are going to be shifted the most because they're attached to the ring. Now, if you had something like an aldehyde, that could be shifted more. Or a carboxylic acid, if you're fortunate enough to see the proton in the carboxylic acid, that could be shifted more. Um, but relatively speaking, usually for many molecules, the ring protons are shifted the furthest downfield. So let's look at the difference between A and B because I'm essentially going to... Um, identify the one that comes first. Um, actually, in the previous case, I, I, I identified the one that came last, um, so the greatest one. So let me look for the one that's most downfield first. Sorry, I said that backwards. All right, so my choices are the C ring protons or the D ring protons. Now, if we look here, the ring protons are shifted relatively far downfield because of something called ring current, and basically, if we look at C, C is relatively close to this electronegative atom, this carbonyl. The carbon's not really electronegative, but the oxygen is. Um, so this is relatively close to this as compared to these. So therefore, C should have the greatest chemical shift. Followed by D, because these are still ring protons, but they're a little bit further away from this electronegative atom, so they come next. Now let's look at um, the next thing, which is between A and B. If we look, B are relatively close to the carbonyl group, relatively close to the oxygen, and A is somewhat farther away from the oxygen. It's one carbon removed. So B is going to be more downfield because it's closer to the electronegative atom. And finally, A is going to be um, the furthest upfield because it's furthest away from the electronegative atom. I do realize we have to learn something new, which is where ring protons come out, um, but I did do an example with the um, ring protons on purpose with an aromatic ring. All right, so this is basically our molecule, and now we've identified the relative chemical shifts. Now for D, we want to do the multiplicity. So we want to identify the multiplicity of the um, of each of the uh, protons. So what we're looking for is the number of adjacent protons. So if we look at C, I'm going to do, uh, actually I'll just do A first. So let's look at A. So A, if we look next to it, on B there are two protons. So there should be 2 plus 1, remember it's n plus 1, which is 3, which is a triplet. So A should be a triplet. It only has one adjacent carbon. B. B only has one adjacent carbon with protons. That would be A. And there are three. So it's N plus one, three plus one, which is four, which we call a quartet. Proton C. So if we look at proton C, 
um, I'm just going to look at one of them. So in this case, this proton is adjacent to, to one proton. So therefore, we would get one plus one and plus one, which is two. And it should look something like a doublet. Then finally, uh, proton D. And um, now I understand that these protons and these protons are going to be different. And this proton is only adjacent to two, so maybe it's a triplet. Um, this proton is also adjacent to two, so maybe it's another triplet. And if you look here, what you actually get is kind of a mess. Um, so I'm just going to put that this is going to be a mul multiple. That should just be crossed out. Because it's not real clear what exactly you're going to get, because these aren't exactly the same protons, kind of like two triplets, um, if you will. Uh, but I'm just going to put that as a multiplet. So now let's review, and then we'll inter uh, interpret the spectrum. So for proton A, what do we know about the protons in A? Well, we know that the integration is three, because there are three protons. We know that they are um, the most downfield, excuse me, the most upfield. Why? Because they are the furthest away from this electronegative atom, and the ring protons, as we know, are between six and eight. So this is the most upfield. And we also know that they should be a triplet. So if we look at this spectrum, the most upfield triplet with an integration of three, that's it. Again, doing it this way first will help you in the long run, even though it's slower. Let's look at B protons. For the B protons, the integration is two. Um, they should be between A, which should be more upfield, and uh, D, which should be more downfield. And in this case, we should have a quartet because this is next to a, uh, a carbon with three protons, so it should be three plus one for a quartet four. If we look at this, these protons, there's a quartet, an integration of two, and they're between A and what will eventually be D. So these are your B protons. C, and we're kind of just combining all this information. For your C protons, the integration is two. They're the most downfield because they're both on a ring and they're adjacent to an electronegative um, carbonyl group. And the integration should look something like a doublet. Sometimes the ring protons aren't perfect. That kind of looks like um, a doublet. And it has an integration of two. And this is the C protons. Finally, the D protons. D should have an integration of three. It should be between uh, B and C, and it should be a multiplet. Of course, by process of elimination as well, we also know that this is your D protons. Okay, so now we have identified or we've done step E, so this is basically step E, we've, done, we've identified the actual spectrum and labeled the peaks. So now, the only thing you have left to do is the individual problems. So on the next three pages, you have propane, phenol, and 3-bromopentane, and you have the exact same jobs that I have just gone through, steps A through E. Again, you do not need to print these out if that's uh, inconvenient for you. Um, you can simply just write this on a piece of paper, write number three propane, and do all the steps A through E. So this will really help you to be prepared for the lab. If you make an honest effort to do it and you turn it in um, with the NMR lab, we will give you five uh, bonus points uh, for spending the time uh, working on this stuff. 
I appreciate you watching the video and I hope that you found it helpful for the practical interpretation of NMR. I just want to say one more time, we are not going into the theory here because this is already a 40 minute video and it would be a two hour video if we went into the theory. I strongly recommend that if you're not familiar with the theory of NMR, you either read it from your textbook or try to find another YouTube video um, that's more theory focused when it comes to NMR. Thanks again for watching, and uh, I hope to have these videos uh, moving forward, although not all for bonus points, but going over the pre-lab, which will give you points, uh, and it will help you uh, to write your pre-lab and understand what's going on in the experiment.